Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Stephanie from Healthy, and I'm really excited to present our topic today, uh, Making Complex Change Accessible and Compelling with Dr. Jessica Haymeyer. Dr. Haymeyer is the founder of Well Empowered. She earned her Master of Science in Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine from the University of Western States, her doctorate in chiropractic medicine from National University of Health Services, and her Bachelor of Arts from UCLA. She is an IFM certified practitioner and active in the organization. She's also a licensed dietitian nutritionist, a certified nutrition specialist, and has studied alongside various physicians at the forefront of functional medicine. We are very lucky to have her here today to present this amazing topic. I just wanna remind you that if you'd like to um, engage, if you have any questions, you can pop it into the Q&A box. Uh, we will have time for Q&A at the end, but Dr. H also uh, is happy to have you ask questions throughout the presentation. So I'll be moderating and reading off your questions as they pop up, if we can squeeze them in during the presentation. And we're just really happy that you're all here today. So Jessica, I'm gonna let you take it away. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, this topic is something that I, for all of us who practice, uh, who use natural interventions in service of the people who we work with, um, I believe this is one of, perhaps foundationally, one of the most um, important things we can master is serve it, you know, working with people and assisting them in the change process and having some go-to approaches that are really effective in doing so. So I really, I think the healthy team, the fabulous healthy team and you, Stephanie, especially for all of your work to bring this webinar to life. And um, a lot of you, I'm sure, already use Healthy as a platform. I'm just going to hop in and say personally, as a practitioner, I've been using healthy for the last two and a half years, and I cannot say a, enough good things about the healthy platform as well as the care and service that the healthy team provides. So if you're a provider out there who has not yet um, encountered healthy in terms of you know, using it clinically, I, I just can't say enough and really encourage you to, to give it a look. So now moving ahead into the conversation of the day, uh, this is a little bit more about me. Uh, Stephanie did a great job of introducing me, but really what I want you to know is my calling in life is people realizing their full potential. And so to me, health is a foundation to bring this calling to life and supporting people in their health journey is one of the biggest privileges uh, of my life. And I really thank you each and all for joining today because I know that you share this commitment. Um, my company, yes, is Well Empowered, and at Well Empowered, my mission is people are victorious in health and inspire others to be the same. So diving into what we're going to be uh, having conversations on today, and as Stephanie said, please go ahead and jump in at any point, chime in with questions comments, yeah, but, et cetera. I want this to be really useful for you. And so have it be, you know, as interactive as you'd like it to be. And towards the end, I'll, you know, specifically solicit questions and invite your comments and, and thoughts. Um, but today the intention is first and foremost that you have access to transformative and sustained outcomes for patients. And that allows you to become known as a practitioner who produces unprecedented outcomes, right? Ones that you're, the people who you work with, your clients, your patients, I know we've got a lot of different types of practitioners on this call today. Whatever your role is in this, uh, you know, health, health pr production process, um, I want you to become known as someone who reliably produces unprecedented outcomes. And of course, we all have a career, right, that we need to tend to. And, you know, we would be silly if we didn't mention part of that career is making money. And so being known as someone who produces unprecedented outcomes gives us access to cultivating both a fulfilling career as well as one that allows us to do the things in life we care about most. And 
the last intention is you contribute to transforming the paradigm of healthcare in a substantial and meaningful way. Each of you come from a different background. Each of you have different uh, skill sets and fabulous things to contribute to the people who you work with. And I really invite you as, you as we engage today to look at this information and what you might uniquely bring to the conversation that would further our shared commitment to transform health and transform the way, the go-to way of approaching health challenges. So specifically today, we're going to be talking about trust and its essential uh, establishment as access to impact. We're not just gonna be talking about it theoretically, we're gonna be talking about how do we establish trust and leaving you with some real actionable things to start to implement in your day-to-day -day practice. We're going to be talking about the problem with only what. We're gonna be talking about the value of why and the genius of what, why, and how. Lastly, we're gonna be talking about strategies that apply Habs rule. Now, some of you may be familiar with that term, Habs rule, and some of you may not, totally fine. What Hebb's rule is, is neurons that fire together, wire together. So fundamentally speaking, it is the neurological foundation for creating new habits and new habits that produce outcomes. So we're going to be looking at strategies that help our cells and the people who we work with create new neurological connections that allow them to cultivate new habits and therefore produce and sustain the outcomes they care most about. So I really invite you to listen today in a particular manner, right? We could listen, we can listen from a place of right or wrong or true or false, or even like what's interesting to me and there's nothing wrong with listening in any of those manners. And in fact, listening in that ma those manners is sometimes exactly what the situation calls for, right? We need to be able to screen true from false in our day-to-day -day lives, um, right, wrong, those kind of things. But today, to have this information be most useful to you, I invite you to listen from what will make a difference for me. Each of you have different skill sets and a different day-to-day -day clinical practice, the way you work with people. And I want the information you pull from today to be relevant for you. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and step into the first piece of this conversation. And that is really looking at trust, right? We all know foundationally whether we're looking at the way we work with others or when we consider engaging another professional, whether that's a mechanic or a plumber or perhaps a healthcare provider for ourselves. The first thing, whether we know it or not, we're looking to answer is, can I trust this individual in front of us? And so we wanna really know that the people who are seeking our guidance are asking the same question, right? They are asking, can I trust this person in front of us? And so it's really useful to start to think about, well, what allows us to cultivate trust? How do we cultivate trust? And so cultivating trust, oftentimes we fall into, we can fall into a habit of leaning on our competence, right? Here are my degrees, my certifications, I've mastered this material. And certainly that is essential, right? Nobody should be seeing someone to solve a problem for which they don't have mastery in solving, right? And so demonstrating your competence, absolutely foundational. However, people interacting with you, they should be able to interact with you assuming that competence, right? Assuming if you're out there in the marketplace, you know, sharing that uh, you can solve these problems that in fact you can. 
so yes, we want to communicate that we are competent and there is more to the trust story. And what I would say is the second essential piece to cultivating trust and often overlooked is our goodwill, right? And in terms of goodwill, it can become a little esoteric and uh, you know, kind of the slippery, how do we communicate goodwill? But fundamentally speaking, the way we communicate our goodwill is by communicating that the people who are seeking our assistance and care, that their outcome is our priority, right? Not building my business, certainly building my business is my priority, is a priority for me, but when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with someone, their outcome is my priority. And my priority of building my business shouldn't be their priority. So really making sure that in our communications, simply put that we are reinforcing that our commitment is their outcome. Our, pri our priority is their outcome. And then lastly, this often represents opportunities is tending to one and two, meaning yeah, we do need to find ways to reinforce our competence, to make sure people know they can trust our competence. And we also need to reinforce that people can trust our goodwill. And so if you think about this in a real uh, you know, personal manner, if you think about the last time you ever needed to call on another professional, again, let's go to a car mechanic, for example. Right, okay, so I want to know that they can not just fix cars, but fix my car, right? So there's that competence aspect. But I also want to be sure that I can be confident that my outcome is their priority, right? They're not going to, you know, misdiagnose the problem with my car. They're going to, uh, that certainly is to some degree an element of competence, but also there is an element of goodwill, right? Can I trust they are really going to be looking to solve the immediate problem rather than upsell me on a million different things? So I invite you to look for yourself for opportunities, whether it's working one-on-one -on -one with someone or in your social media or in your newsletters, however it is you're communicating, to see opportunities that you could either very naturally reinforce your competence, and then secondly, reinforce your goodwill, reinforce that your commitment is producing the outcomes for the people who come to see you. So now turning our attention to what? So when we're working one-on-one -on -one with people, we certainly need to know what they are seeking to get out of our work together, right? Simply put, what outcome are you looking to get? And then reflecting ourselves, can I produce that outcome, right? That's a part of goodwill is really being transparent. If someone comes to you and asks you, can you produce this outcome? If the answer is no, we want to be really comfortable, not just comfortable, but you know, have it be really natural to give an honest no answer and perhaps provide different resources if a different resource is more appropriate for their problem at hand. So first and foremost, we want to help our clients and patients give words to what they are coming to get. You know, sometimes people come to sit in and they'll say something like, oh, I just want to be healthy. Okay, well, but what does being healthy look like to you? I need to be, get very, very clear on what your outcomes are so that I can make them my priority. Well, and even before that, ensure that they are outcomes that I can feel confident we can produce together. So supporting people in clarifying what their wins are, what their must have health outcomes is foundational. And Yogi Berra, genius philosopher, right? If you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. So understanding what people want to get out of their work together and having it be very, very clear is certainly essential as well. However, there is a problem if we only get our what down. If we only know what our clients or patients are coming to get, 
I, in my experience, am not going to be able to effectively guide people in making change compelling and accessible. In this example here, I don't know, you know, I know we've got people joining us from all over the place. And I don't know, is anyone here from Chicago? I'm going to take a look at the chat and my chat's over on my right screen. So I'm just going to turn my head for a second. Anyone, any Chicagoans here? We'll see if anybody chimes in. Okay, yes. All right, Tita's from Chicago. Love it. So Tita, you may, may recognize this. Yes, Shy town my hometown. Love it, Susan. Woohoo! Okay, so you fabulous Chicagoans, uh, you may recognize this. Uh, I am in Chicago also, and this is the bleachers at Wrigley Field. Uh, how we miss this view this summer, right? So the reason why I put this this uh, image in here is that you know the scoreboard. That is the what, right? The point of a game is to win, right? So if we think about baseball and we think about what, it gives us a really great analogy. So for example, your batter, they're coming up to bat, right? The score here, you know, let's call it, you know, here if we look at the scoreboard, unfortunately in this game, St. Louis was, was winning, right? So four to two, Cubs are down, the batter comes up, the bases are loaded, they know they need, they need a grand slam, right? So the what is I need to get points. However, if all the batter does is look at the scoreboard, the what, good luck, right? They are, there's not a chance that they're going to be able to produce the outcome called winning, right? We have more points than St. Louis if they're only focused on the what. And for those of you who work with people who either have a long history of what I call riding the weight loss roller coaster, right? For them, not just losing weight, but sustaining an optimal weight, that would be really a true victory and one they really, really want. People often confuse the scale, you could call that the scoreboard, with a lot of other things, right? Yes, we need to understand what our must-have health outcomes are, but if we only focus on them, as opposed to what's gonna get us there, we're not going to be effective. And so actually communicating that to people, right? Communicating that, yes, we need to know what your ideal scoreboard looks like, but we don't wanna confuse that scoreboard with the actual act of batting, right? With the actual act of cultivating the skills necessary to effectively perform. So your what, the outcomes we must have are important, but so too are many other factors. And we, we wanna make sure people get the difference between the scoreboard and the actions that they need to take in order to produce the number they like on the scoreboard. Again, whether that's weight or fasting glucose or hemoglobin A1C or their lipid panel, their, you know, a million different things, even, you know, their digestion, right? Lots of different ways we could look at this, but we want to really get clear that the scoreboard is important, but it's a side effect. The scoreboard is a side effect of effectively being able to perform the actions to get that outcome called a scoreboard we like. So I say that words create our world, right? There's really a power in the way that we words thing, word things. And so typically we might speak about uh, weight loss as a goal, right? A goal. Really, what I would propose is that we change that and we start to talk about, again, whether it's fasting glucose or weight or lipid panel, we start to look at that instead of a goal as a standard of effectiveness, okay? And what I mean by that is it really is reflecting, it's a reflection of how effective our interventions are, as well as our client or patient's ability to consistently take actions that align with the treatment plan we're recommending, right? And so, yes, of course, we need to have effective interventions. We need to have effective natural treatment plans. But 
we also need to support people in consistently taking those actions. And, and we're going to talk more about, you know, how we can help people with that. But this is one of the ways, right? Helping people shift their mindset. The scoreboard, right, is not a goal. It's actually a reflection of our effectiveness in the interventions and the actions that are being consistently taken. So now we're going to turn our attention to the value of why? So we heard that great quote by Yogi Berra, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. Certainly true. I would add to this, and if you take one thing away from our time together, my hope it, it, is that it is around the value of why. And simply put, what I say is if you don't know where you're going and why you're going there, you'll end up someplace else. And I'm gonna invite everyone to start to look inward and see how this has become true for you, right? All of you have gained mastery in your uh, knowledge and your clinical skills. Um, and in that, you've also gained mastery in your own health. And so if you start to think about your personal journey, whether it's uh, you know what it took to do the academic work to get where you are, or what it has taken to refine your health habits, health promoting habits, I would suspect that as you contemplate that, there was something that was really compelling to you. There was a why. You know, what, what, what is it about this work that has you be lit up in life? Why must you do this work? There are a lot of jobs in the world, right? But there's a why behind this work that you find really compelling. And so that led you to do everything you needed to do to tool up to be able to do it. You know, going to, graduate school, graduate school, getting certified, attending seven seminars, joining today, right? There's definitely a why if you are doing this work. And so too for the people who you work with, right? There is a why behind their what. And helping people identify their why is one of the most powerful things you can do. And to bring this idea to life, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the value of why and illustrate it through context, okay? So why creates the context? Answering the question why creates a context that allows us to look at things differently. And so what you see here is a desk piled high with uh, you know, disheveled desk with piled high with paper. And I'd like you, to, we're going to engage in an exercise of imagination. Okay. And so this exercise is, is we're going to take ourselves back to December, 2019, right? Okay. So I want you to put yourself at December, 2019, let's call it December 20th. Okay. And it's a Friday and you look at your desk and this is what your desk looks like. And it's about, you know, four o'clock. The clock is ticking. You're about to leave the office for the weekend and not just the weekend, but the next 10, you know, 14 days, let's say. Okay. And you look at this mess and instead of feeling overwhelmed, frustrated, and just, you know, just like, oh my gosh, how am I going to get this done? Maybe a little panic stricken. You don't have a care in the world. You feel elated, you're excited, you are just full of joy. And the reason why you're full of joy, even though this is what you see, is because you have tickets on your phone and the next day you're going to Hawaii. Okay, so you're about to go on this amazing vacation with loved ones. And even though this is what you're looking at, the context called tomorrow. I get to have this fabulous experience with loved ones is shaping the way that you're seeing this current moment. So now I want you to scoot yourself ahead 14 days. You're fast forwarding. You've been on this amazing vacation. You've done all the things you love to do. You've hiked, you've had a fabulous time with loved ones, laughed your, you know, laughed your head off. And even though you're sitting on this amazing beach in Hawaii uh, with this vista that takes your breath away, you feel overwhelmed, you feel panic stricken, and 
you know, just a real sense of anxiety. And the reason why you feel that is you look down at your phone and this is what you see, right? So this, this, uh, you know, 32,000 plus inbox is looming as something that is going to be, um, you know, greeting you on your arrival back to reality the next day. So that really is to give you a sense that context, it's, it's a slippery thing. We can't exactly put our finger on it. And yet it shapes everything. And we can help people in creating an empowered context and that what and why is your access to it. So what I would say about that why in terms of its profound ability to shape your view of the world is you don't buy what you do, you buy why you do it. Uh, some of you may have heard of Simon Sinek. Has anybody heard of Simon Sinek? He uh, has done quite a few TED Talk and TED Talks, and he he had one, I believe it was 2012, the, the first TED Talk that he did. And he talks about businesses and he talks about businesses who have had the ability to evolve, grow, and inspire over the years. Of course, top of mind is Apple and Google and you know a bunch of others like that. But one of the things that he points to in this conversation is that as a business, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Well, what I would say as individuals, we don't buy what we do, we buy why we do it. And your clients and patients are no different. There is nothing particularly compelling about not having dessert for someone who loves dessert, right? There is nothing particularly compelling about you know, skipping the extra glass of wine for someone who loves wine. However, if they can start to access the why, you know, why, why would they even consider doing this thing called skipping dessert? Why would they even consider doing this thing called cutting their alcohol consumption in half? If they can really connect to their why, they're going to be able to get inertia in their favor. They're going to have a spiral up benefit, something that allows them not just to produce short-term outcomes, but when connected to their why, sustain the actions that allows for sustained outcomes. So, okay. sorry, yeah. I just want to jump in. We have a question from uh, Marcia, um, and she was wondering if you could give a dietetic example of, with the client of how you use the why. Yeah, absolutely, and really great question, Marcia. And um, here I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a little bit uh, more information on that why right here and share how it might shape someone right how, how it might uh, actually translate into actions because that is fundamentally what we're looking at is helping people take actions right all the information in the world I'm sure all of you have uh, you know I know what it takes to create a treatment plan it takes a lot of thought and a lot of work and a lot of care. And so to spend all that time and thought and, you know, really find people unable to effectively turn it into action, that's really, you know, the, the problem we're working to solve here in this conversation. And so helping people get connected to their why gives you access to that, gives you access to helping people take new actions with consistency. So I will circle back and give you a little more information on that, Marsha, but hopefully this conversation here will help start to bring it to life. So what I am going to invite all of you to do here in a moment, I'm gonna set an alarm for two minutes, and I'm gonna invite you to start to engage in a conversation called what is my vision of vitality now i'm sure a lot of you are already living your vision of vitality that's wonderful but i invite you to engage in this exercise regardless of where you are because it will give you a real life experience that you can then translate and provide to the people who you work with so your vision of vitality ultimately is the access to creating a powerful context. And your vision of vitality involves the what and the why. 
So in a moment, I'm going to give you two minutes on the clock to start to take notes to answer the question, what are your must-have health outcomes? And I want you to see that each of these words is very important. I want to know what your must-have health outcomes are, not what your partner, wife, husband, doctor says you should have. What are your must-have health outcomes? And they are must-have. They are not wants, right? Um, you know, I could tell my husband, I, 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 I want a villa in the south of France. He would say, thank you very much for sharing right? A want is not the same as a must have. And so we want to really help people relate to this from a place of, you know, energetic hunger. I must have these outcomes. And so there are different places to look and identifying must have health outcomes. Must have health outcomes can fly in how you feel, right? Those are for people who come to see us for uh, digestive distress or low energy or mood or, you know, focus, all of those different things. So how you feel. Another place that your must-have health outcomes might live is how you look, right? We want to look our best. And really, most people want to look their best because they feel most confident in their own skin and freed up headspace when they do. But how you look, how, you know, is that a must-have health outcome for you? what you're able to do, so the physical ability to do things, and what I like to call your longevity likeliness. Okay, so each of these, you know, depending on where you are in your health and your life, you may find that only one of these is relevant for you, or you may hear yourself in all four. And this shifts over time, right? What our must-have health outcomes are when they're, we're 18 or 20 is probably and appropriately different than what they are when we're 50 or 60 or something like that. So again, I'm going to set the clock here for two minutes and invite you each to take pen to paper or fingers to keyboard and answer these questions for yourself. Okay, let's have you go ahead and start to wrap up what you're doing here and we're going to move on. But I do invite you if you were not able to fully put down on paper the answer to these questions, I do invite you after our time together today to circle back and complete this because it will provide something for you. And also having done the exercise yourself you can then take it and use it with the people who you work with and your personal familiarity with it will be a contribution to them. So the second question that is included in your vision of vitality is 
why must you have these health outcomes? Again, all of these words, very important. Why must you? It is you, These are your must-have health outcomes. I want to know why you must have them. And so this question is, can be broken down into two basic answers. One of them is what I call the stick on the back. And that's the unwanted outcome that is likely to pass if health continues on the same trajectory. And the second is the carrot dangling. And that is what becomes available if we shift the trajectory of your health and you get those outcomes that you must have. Now, one thing I would say, Marsha, just to chime in and, and really give a little more light to this is it is essential for both of these questions that your client and patients answer them, right? There is no, if you are, if you think you can feed them their what and their why, uh-uh. They have to be in the driver's seat, right? They need to be what I call well-empowered. They need to have skin in the game. They need to know what their must-have health outcomes are and why they are important to them. And so giving them the time and the space to reflect on these answers is essential to having that be useful in your clinical pursuits. So in a moment here, I'm gonna set the timer again and give you the opportunity to contemplate of these must-have health outcomes that you wrote down for yourself, why must you have them? So the first question, again, the stick on the back, is what would the probable future look like without your must-have health outcomes. So if we take your health right now where it is and we continue on the same trajectory, go out five years, go out 10 years, go out 20 years, what is your experience of life? And you know, how do you feel about it? And while this might feel a little bit, you know, uh, overwhelming to contemplate, it's really important. All of us make choices to change based on pain we want to avoid. And so ignoring this is really missing an opportunity to support our clients and patients. So let's go ahead and give everybody 30 seconds. I'm just gonna give you a quick 30 here to contemplate the answer to this question. What would the probable future look like without your must have health outcomes? Okay, I want to uh, see, so Sherry asked, how do I handle the many clients who only want a meal plan and can't seem to get out of the diet mentality? Simply put, I don't work with them. I really don't. Um, because I am committed that people are victorious in their health. And if they are, it's not to say, I mean, most people who walk in my door, at least in some way, shape or form, if weight loss or heart health is top of mind, they have been marinating in the diet mentality. Of course, they're walking in my virtual door with that mentality. And before I even agree to work with someone, I'm having a 30 minute conversation to see, can we, you know, is this a must have health outcome? And not just to have for a moment or a whole 30, right? But for the rest of your life, if they're not in it to win it, you know, long-term sustained outcomes, simply put, I am not going to be a fit for them. And until, you know, if they, certainly there are going to be people who that's where they are in the moment, nothing wrong, zero judgment, but until they're able to get beyond that and really get the cost, you know, they're just sick of this unsustainable, uh, you know, weight loss roller coaster, the headspace it takes up, the physical, emotional suffering that goes with it. If they're not there, then I'm not going to be a solution for them. But there are a lot of other people who are happy to work with those. So I, I'm not concerned that they're not going to find a resource. It's just that's not the game that I play. So next, I'm going to invite everyone to answer the question of why. What is the carrot dangling? And so the carrot dangling questions, there are a few. 
One is what becomes available with your must have health outcomes realized for yourself, for others, and for the world. Like no joke, really, there is something that becomes available for the world when your must have health outcomes are realized. So I'm gonna invite you to answer this question as well as the second carrot dangling question, which is who would you become for yourself with your health handled, right? There's a woman who I work with who she got that through being victorious. Her goals are, you know, she's pre-diabetic. She, um, she, her BMI is well over 30. It's in the high 30s, so she is clinically obese. And she gets that mastery of her health through doing that, she will know herself as a hero. And that, you know, that's pretty compelling. That's pretty darn moving. So I'm gonna give everyone a minute here to contemplate the carrot dangling. What becomes available with your must-have health outcomes realized for yourself, for others, for the world, and who would you become for yourself with your health handled? Okay, I'll have you start to wrap up your carrot dangling. And again, just like the what, if there's more there for you, I really invite you to sit down after our time together and complete this thought process. What are your whys? The stick on the back in the carrot dangling. So why all of this, right? People are better persuaded by the reasons they discuss themselves discover than those that come into the minds of others. And so to this point, this is why it's really essential that your clients and patients do the, um, you know, pro give the emotional energy necessary in order to prevail. It is in service of the outcomes they came to get us giving them answers, us creating their must-have health outcomes for us, that's the old paradigm. We are not part of that paradigm. People need to be able to look inward and really honestly answer the question, what are my must-have health outcomes and why are they important to me? And this is really a new, creates a new context that makes new outcomes possible and really transformative outcomes possible. So in the middle here of this, we see the, the my well-empowered flower and you wanna think about that as your vision of vitality. When you have this new context, the what and the why of your must-have health outcomes as your North Star, that creates a new perspective, a totally new relationship to information you may already have. And a new perspective leads to new thoughts, new thoughts lead to new actions, and new actions lead to new outcomes. And outcomes reinforce our perspective. So to give you a little more information about this vision of vitality, ultimately when I have people create their vision of vitality, they are creating it strictly from a carrot dangling perspective. So certainly answering the stick on the back why question is very important for the change process. But the formalized vision of vitality statement is answering the question, what are you for? Because our brain doesn't understand knots. Our brain doesn't understand 
I don't want to X, Y, Z. The, the, the not part, neurologically speaking, doesn't really translate. And so it's important to first think about the, the unwanted outcomes. But when crafting a vision of vitality statement, you want it to be all carrot dangling. And so here are some examples of powerful visions of vitality, right? I am beautifully in love with my well-being, self-image, and all that I am. I embrace my wonderful life and all who surround me. My confidence shines and my happiness is abundant. You see here that there's not a word about the scale. There's not a word about her labs. It is a woman, that first one. But, right, she's really answering the what and the why of her health. Next, we have, I am empowered by my body's beauty and ability. Through realizing my fullest potential, I inspire others to realize their fullest potential. And then the last example we have here, I feel good about myself as I age. I am healthy physically, emotionally, and mentally. This allows me to connect with loved ones and fully experience the joys of this great life. In all of these, you really hear the love. You hear the love of self. You hear the love of others in abundance, right? For so many people, they have been living as if their health was an obligation, when really, if they got down to it and just gave it a few minutes of thought, they would be able to see their health as a contribution. And that changes everything. So, there's a fabulous quote, knowledge is effective action, right? And that is really the wonder of combining the what, the why, and the how. So supporting people in taking information. Information is interesting. Information is in the books. Information is the abundance of diet books and meal plans and all those things. All of that information is great, but if it's not translated into action, it's not knowledge. So knowledge is effective action. And so when I work with people, this is how I work, right? First, we come from a place of love, love of self, love of life, love of others. And I provide people with the what. What do they need to do? Where is their, you know, their labs are the what. what is, where is their health right now versus where they want it to be? We would need to know that gap. We need data to know that gap. And so information is essential. And I also need to be able to effectively guide them on closing that gap right? The, all the information we've all gathered in our professional endeavors, we need to be able to turn that into a plan and effective, in, it, effect, effectively communicated information for our clients and patients. And we need to help them in connecting to their why. This is not a habit, right? Connecting to a why around health, this is not the day-to-day -day conversation they encounter on commercials and in social media and you know, everywhere else that they're, the water they're swimming in in this world. And so helping them really stay grounded in their why is tremendously powerful. Into, uh, I'm gonna speak a little bit more to that in a moment. And then we also need to be able to help our, the people we work with get a toolbox of strategies, right? If you think of your own health and your own life, you have strategies that you pull out all the time, whether it's preparing food in advance, or you know, keeping your go-to snacks in your fridge, whatever it is, you've got lots of strategies. Putting your tennis shoes on at the beginning of the day, leaving your phone in the kitchen, right? There are tons of different strategies. Helping your clients and patients get their own toolbox of strategies is gonna be really important. So strategies that apply have this role, right? So build intention for your outcomes just as you build a strong physical body through constant systematic use. Repetition is the mother of all skill. So this here is really communicating not just the power of helping your clients and patients create their vision of vitality, answering what are your must-have health outcomes and why are they important to you, but we also want to remember they are swimming in an environment, an environment that I call the force field. I actually, I do an entire webinar on the force field, right? The force field is the inherited conversation around health. It's the one that says, 
food as good or bad or has your clients say I cheated, right? They confuse morality with outcomes. There's no good or bad in food. There's no cheating. There's simply choices that either produce outcomes or don't. And that's not a character judgment. It's, it's not a question of morality. It's just a question of are those actions going to produce the outcomes you're committed to, right? And so helping people stay connected to a different perspective requires the application of Hub's rule, which again states neurons that fire together, wire together. Their brain is currently wired for those short-term outcomes. It's currently wired for the diet mentality. We need to recognize that and not see that as wrong or bad or unjust, but really cultivate skills that help people in this shift. And that's one of the most powerful things we can do in our contribution to shifting the current paradigm around health and healthcare. So what does it look like to support our, the people who we work with? It looks like actually, yes, taking the time to help people create their vision of vitality. And I have to tell you, when, I'm, when I work with people who in particular um, have a long history of struggling with consistency in their health habits, every conversation I have, we're gonna start by having them speak aloud their vision of vitality. And it's really important that they speak aloud because they need to own it. They created it. They're actually speaking it into existence. Not only that, but I actually give people weekly exercises uh, depending on what they need. And one of the common weekly exercises I give people is I'm gonna, your exercise this week is to read your vision of vitality aloud every day. Build that intention just like you would build your biceps by doing bicep curls, right? It is, it requires re repetition and consistency in that repetition in order to create a new mindset, especially against everything that says that, you know, short term outcomes are the way to go. So one red flag conversation that you'll encounter to know that their vision of vitality is missing is something in the order of obligation. So it's something like, do I have to reduce my alcohol consumption or do I have to give up dessert? And so one of the things that's really important for practitioners is to always empower our clients and patients. We always want to put them in the driver's seat. And so in this conversation, because I hear this, right? People say this to me and what I say to them is, you don't have to do anything. You would only make a change if you wanted a different outcome. So you said your must have health outcome is X, Y, Z. You said it's losing 15 pounds. You said it's bringing your liver enzymes to a normal level. You said it's sleeping soundly. And so if those actually are your must have health outcomes, what you would want to do is reduce your alcohol consumption, but only you can do that. Like only you can say if it's worth it, right? So really taking the world of obligation out of the conversation and constantly going back to a conversation of empowerment. So recurrent choices plus your genes equals a measurable impact. And we know that. We see that in our work. We see that in our lives. We see that in the research that we have done, right? And so cultivating the context is foundational to cultivating effective actions. And also looking at when you're working with people, get curious and customize, right? Understand is, is this person in front of me an auditory learner? Are they visual? Are they kinesthetic? Help them get the information and internalize it in a way that speaks to them. And structured support is required to prevail against the force field, right? So that means really in using accountability as a strategy yourself and not just policeman strategy, but helping people give them the time and space to reflect and reground in their must-have health outcomes and why they are so important to them. So to sum it up, today we have talked about trust. We've talked about the problem of only what, the value of why, the genius of what, why, and how, and how we can use 
Hebb's rule, right? Neurons that fire together, wire together to our advantage. And when your health is handled, you bring fully to this world what only you can. And that is a gift not to be missed. That is why I do this work. And I know a lot of you share that. So this is where, if we're not already connected, this is where you can connect with me. I'd love to be connected to, uh, to all of you. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And I'm gonna open up the floor for some questions here. Would anyone like to chime in and share their thoughts, what they've seen out of our time together or ask any questions? You can raise a hand, you can drop a, a line in the chat box, or you can drop a question in the Q&A. How would you handle someone with disordered eating? Really good question, Sherry. So, there are a few things. First of all, I would want to make sure it's appropriate, right, where they are in their um, recovery process and their, is that it would be appropriate for me to work with them. There have been situations where I really felt that the person would be best served and working with a mental health professional. And if that's the case, I'm gonna be transparent. I'm going to send them there. However, there are other cases where, you know, they're, they're not in that kind of acute dire situation. They just have a, an unhealthy relationship with food or their body or the scale or whatever. And I'm gonna work with it in the same way. What are your must have health outcomes and why are they important to you? Right, if people can really calm down and start to look at that, something becomes available. You know, if someone's seeking my care because they know they are in this chronic binge fast sort of situation or whatever the case may be, they see that the choices they're making are not working for them. And so I want to help them gain access to a place of self love rather than shame and embarrassment and come from that carrot dangling and start to take new actions that produce new outcomes. I work in a clinic where clients might be required to see an RD. Often they lack motivation and see the appointment, appointment as an annoyance. Any advice how to plant a seed in the client's mind for change when they aren't ready for change quite yet? I, Heather, honestly, I would, still, um, I would still ask them, you know, if they're not already aware of the consequences, you know, perhaps there's some education required, um, but if they're not already aware of the co likely consequences, we can't predict the future, but the likely consequences of no change in health, um, being really transparent with people about that is, is, I think, really important. And so it could be something like, I will tell people, listen, okay, let's talk about longevity, right? longevity bet we could place a bet on someone's longevity and how this might look is let's go to vegas right i'm going to go to vegas and heather i'm going to look i'm going to have in my hand at vegas i'm going to have your labs i'm sure they're gorgeous right i'm going to see your lipid panel and your fasting glucose and your hemoglobin a1c your insulin i'm going to know your bmi i'm going to know how much you sleep i'm going to know all these great things and at this table at Vegas, I have two options. I can put all my chips betting on Heather's longevity or in the other direction against it. Sounds kind of harsh, but those are the options. Yes or no. I'm guessing for Heather, all my chips are going on longevity, right? Now for the people who walk in your, cl your, uh, uh, your clinic, probably not the case. And so finding a way to kindly answer that question right? You are answering it from a place of committed service. There's zero judgment. You really, I mean, we want people to live and to thrive. And that's where this is coming from. And so being transparent with people about the outcomes they can expect, if nothing changes, can be quite powerful. And then engaging them and, you know, why would you want to be here for a long time? Most people, they're going to talk about their family. They're going to talk about the work they love to do. They're going to talk about things that are really important to them in the world. And that shifts the relationship to that appointment with the RD. Oh, thanks, Wendy. Oh, my goodness. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you found some valuable pearls in here for yourself. Okay. Anything else anyone would like to chime in with?
Thank you, Dr. Haymeyer, for uh, this really engaging and empowering webinar. It was full of so much important information. Uh, everyone, the recording will be sent out uh, to everyone via email. If you do not receive it for whatever reason, you can email me at hello at gethealthy.com and we'll send you the direct link. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, everyone, for attending today. If you have any questions, you can reach out. Uh, to Dr. Haymeyer. Um, she provided her information and hope that everybody stays safe, stays healthy, and thanks again. Thank you so much, Stephanie. It's such a pleasure to be with everyone today. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.